Um, okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the 50th anniversary NISAC conference. Um, this is very exciting. It's my first real conference. I came last year, but I was not a board member. And I'm just thrilled about the panels that I've heard so far. They've been majorly in interesting and very important. And they're stressing the importance of the Bond Act, which I am not allowed to advocate for, but everybody else who is on this panel is allowed to advocate for, I believe. I'm not sure that Maureen is, but Steve certainly is and Lori, Laura can. Um, and our guests are, we're very lucky to have such prestigious and interesting guests. This is the panel, by the way, on water and agriculture and just a, a quick note, which is that when you're done with this panel, um, just go back to Gather Town and you can join another panel. And if everybody would be so kind as to zoo as to mute themselves if they haven't yet, then we won't get any background noise. So our panelists are um, Maureen Coleman, who is the ex president and executive officer of, excuse me, New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation. She used to work with the New York State Bridge Authority, has served as an assistant counsel to the governor, and was with the DEC before that for 13 years. So we're very honored to have Maureen here. We have Laura Langnick, who is a researcher, policymaker, educator, and farmer, and she's been working for decades on sustainability. She's led award-winning soil health and sustainability research, farming research at the USDA. And she has studied the effects of adaptation and farming. She's led na national, state, and local research and planning projects that take advantage of working lands as a community resilience strategy. She's got a book out and you can read her entire bio in our bios on the NISAC website. Um, and Laura has to leave early, so she'll stay probably for the first two presentations, hers and Maureen's. But if you have any questions afterwards for Laura, I will put her contact information in the chat. And you can also find her for Glenwood Center, Glenwood, G-L-Y-N-W-O-O-D, Center for Regional Farming, Food and Farming in Cold Spring, New York. And then we've got the honorable and honor, much honored Steve Otis with us, who's a state assemblyman for the 91st district in Westchester County. And he's in his fifth term and he's played a leadership role on environmental issues locally and statewide. Uh, he's initiated the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2015. He advocates for envi environmental issues in Albany, including EV charging infrastructure, flood mitigation, coastal resilience, open space preservation, and support for parks. Uh, he's been a NISAC board member on the board of directors for almost 30 years, and um, we're delighted to have him here. And he's going to um, uh, do cleanup at the end and give an overview of what we're doing here. So um, I'd very happy to um, introduce Laura Langnick from Glenwood Farms or Glenwood Center for Regional F Food and Farms. Um, and uh, we actually have not known each other before. Oops, hold on. Let me admit all these people from the waiting room. There are a lot of people waiting. They're all joining. We're just waiting for everyone to join everybody. And if you would be so kind as to mute yourself when you come into the room. Um, and then Laura, you can unmute yourself. Okay, and I'm gonna make Laura the host. And she's the host and now she'll start sharing with us. Welcome, Laura Legnick from Glenwood. <laughs> well, thank you. I uh, really appreciate the chance to be a part of this panel. Um, and the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming is 
quite a mouthful. So you did really well, Julie, in, <laughs> in trying to describe who we are. Um, so I am, I'll just get, get started uh, with my presentation. Let's see. Great. So are, does it, is everybody seeing my slides? Is that working, Julie? Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, so as Julie said, I'm the director of agriculture at the Glenwood Regional, at the Glenwood Center. See, I messed it up too. The, the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming. And it is about a 20 year old uh, nonprofit based in Cold Spring. And we work, have worked over that time to create a Hudson Valley that is known for food where farming thrives. Um, so the focus of our work is to create networks of change makers to improve the, the sustainability, the resilience and equity in the food system in the Hudson Valley. So I was asked today to, to think about and, and also to, to present some of my thoughts about how the Bond Act, climate resilience and agriculture um, might uh, intersect, interact in ways that will allow us to achieve the goals of the Bond Act while also uh, supporting agriculture and food systems in New York. So first of all, um, I've been thinking about and writing about doing research on agri uh, the adaptation of agriculture to climate change for about, uh, it, in a very focused way, for about a decade now. Uh, I got into this work when I was invited to be a lead author on the 2013 USDA report, Climate Change and Agriculture in the United States, Effects and Adaptation. And I was the lead author on the adaptation chapter. And so among the conclusions of this report, were three that I think is uh, are relevant to thinking about the Bond Act today. And the first is that it's going to get more difficult and expensive to grow food. That's because what some of the effects of climate change on the weather are particularly uh, difficult for farmers to manage. In, and for example, too much and not enough water. So weather is much more variable, particularly precipitation. We certainly all, uh, those of us in the, the drought areas in New York and surrounding community and surrounding states this year had a taste of that with the, with the extreme drought that many parts of this region uh, just have just come out of so it's going to get so we've got too much and not enough water and also there's been quite a change in temperature patterns seasonal temperature patterns and also more extreme temperature changes so these are just a few of the specific climate change effects that are going to make it more difficult and more expensive to grow food Climate stress, also all of these chain, clim, uh, weather changes are going to create stress, not only on farms, but it will also strain relationships between farmers and communities. And another very important finding, and I think particularly appropriate for what we're thinking about today with the Bond Act, is uh, that agricultural landscapes can also be a source of climate change solutions. And so as we think about agriculture, as a solution to some of the resilience challenges ahead. We can think about perhaps we can change, if we can change our thinking about how agriculture might serve uh, our communities in terms of resilience, then we can address and maybe reduce that strain on relationships just a little bit. And, and in fact, I think if we were to really uh, embrace this idea that agriculture is a source of solutions. We could actually even turn those relationships into very positive and um, beneficial, mutually beneficial relationships. So what I have to show you today is just a few examples of, of how I see that we might be able to do that. So this, and I will focus uh, mostly today on this challenging climate change of too much and not enough water, the increased variability of rainfall, because this panel, we're thinking about water in this panel today. 
and uh, water quality, water quantity issues. And so I think we could get, let's get right to the source very simply. Uh, it turns out that soil is the, the major determiner between, uh, um, between whether water is, is uh, soaked in, is received by the surface when it rains or when we have irrigation or whether it runs off. And so this, this either or, it's either will infiltrate, it will move on down to restore the groundwater or some of it will be stored in the soil body itself or it isn't able to infiltrate and so it runs off the surface and then into surface waters. Um, that very simple yet very profound effect in our ecosystems um, is is moderated or mediated by the quality of the soil. So soil quality, so soil has a very important role to play in this uh, question of what happens to water when it hits the surface. And so thinking now about that same model, you've got rainfall or irrigation, water is either flowing into the, is, is either being absorbed by the soil, captured by the soil, stored, or it's running off. Now I, I want to show you how agricultural management or the practices that farmers use on, on farms um, can influence this equation. What happens to water? Does it soak in or does it run off? And so in a typical commodity farm, uh, you see that there's some infiltration of water. There's also some runoff. Um, and compare that to what we can call a typical diversified farm. So as you can see, there's a little more complexity in the landscape. There's a little more diversity of plants. There's uh, livestock. And what you see is that in this kind of a farm, much more water is able to infiltrate the soil and there's much less runoff. And when we're thinking about the impacts of agriculture and whether they can be a source of solutions or whether it can be a source of solutions or a source of problems, it really comes down to the effect of the practices that a farmer chooses and how that affects runoff and, and also storage of water in the soil. So I just want to, to show you just a few pictures of some of the practices that we know are particularly good at reducing runoff and increasing the amount of water that's received, that the, the soil can receive during the rainfall event and also can store between rainfalls. And so one of those practices is reduced tillage. So I'll just move through these pictures. Um, one is reduced tillage and that just means using um, practices that allow you to disturb the soil um, less than full plowing. So there's some pictures here of just, we're showing covered soil covered by different materials or covered by plant crops and also just less tillage or even no tillage of the soil. So that's just a picture of a vegetable farm in the Hudson Valley that, that's using reduced tillage practices. Cover crops are, are another practice that are very useful in uh, helping the soil receive and store water and reducing runoff. And cover crops are just the planting of any crop that you're not going to be harvesting to sell. And they, um, they act, they improve soil, soil health by um, first just occupying the soil, covering the soil so there's no bare soil at any time of the year. And then also when, when they're cut down and left on the surface, then they provide, uh, they improve soil life and increase carbon in the soil. So both, so cover crops act in that way to improve um, the ability of soil to hold water and to reduce runoff. Another practice that's, that's very effective is managed grazing. So this is putting animals in on pasture and moving through, moving them through the pasture in a um, a systematic way in order to maximize the the positive benefits to, to animal action and, and the, through the pastures and minimize any negative benefits. So that's managed grazing, just moving animals, livestock through pastures in a systematic way. And the last practice 
practice I just want to share just a little about is agroforestry. And this is where we're beginning to, um, you're beginning to see more of this. There's a lot of interest in this in as an adaptation or farm resilience practice. And this is, this is the practice of mixing trees and shrubs in an agricultural landscape. And you're seeing just two pictures there. That, that's our sheep at Glenwood Farm um, grazing through an old apple orchard. And then a second example is alley cropping in which you're, you've got rows of trees in your annual cropping fields and then you're, you're uh, growing annual crops between the rows of trees. So these are four practices that we know are particularly useful for improving the ability of the soil to capture and store water and reduce runoff. And I just want to give you a few examples based on research of the kinds of improvements when you use these practices, how this improves the um, water, the, the way water moves through agricultural landscapes. And the benefits, there are benefits to the farm, but also benefits to the community. And the few examples, um, we know that these practices increase soil infiltration. So that's the ability of the soil to capture and store water. Uh, if we can reduce tillage, it, it increases infiltration by about 30%. Cover crops, 35%. If we use intensive grazing, that's moving animals across the landscape in a, in a specific way, that actually can increase soil infiltration by 58%. And then adding perennial crops, trees and shrubs, to annual crop fields can increase soil inf infiltration by 59%, so pretty significant impacts, positive impacts on infiltration. And every bit of water that is actually received by the soil and stored in the soil is water that doesn't run off into surface waters. But it turns out, so these are all benefits to, to the farm, but this increased ability for the soil to capture and store water also benefits community. And, it, and some simulate some uh, simulation studies. So looking at models and taking into account the research that's shown us how practices change infiltration. Uh, we find we can, there's research that's been done that found that by, uh, if all farms in a region were able to adopt, adopt at least some of these practices, it actually reduces flood risk in the region. And it does it both by reducing runoff during flood years. So when we have high levels of high rainfall years by about 20%, and it also reduces flood frequency by about 20%. So these are some of just the specific benefits of using these particular practices that uh, add diversity to the landscape, to farm landscapes. Some specific benefits to water management, Plus, there are many other climate resilience benefits. For example, increased biodiversity, more wildlife habitat, um, and also carbon sequestration. So I've just given you some examples of the benefits. And there's also been research asking farmers around the country, um, do they recognize these benefits? What do they think? Are these practices particularly useful um, as they as they are thinking about managing this increased risk for more variable weather. And so what I've done here is just brief summary of some of the research in the last decade or so, asking farmers in different states, and these are mostly commodity crop producers, so they're growing these the, the big crops, um, corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, those kinds of crops. And, and we, the question was, if you, what will you do, what have you done, or what will you do if, if weather, um, what have you done as weather's become more variable, or what will you do if it becomes more variable um, to reduce the risk of that variability? And so I, I won't go through each line, but I think you can pretty quickly see, uh-oh, I've lost hosting. Can you still see my slides? Julie, you're, you're um, muted. OK. Um, I'm going to get it back to you, Laura. Sorry about that. I don't know. Yeah. You got it. OK, thanks.
Great, we see it. Okay, great. But what I, what I want to show you is that if you just take a look at the, the practices that are listed across the top, reduced tillage, irrigation or drainage, cover crops, diverse, diversifying the landscape, um, and then two others, more insurance, which I haven't mentioned, and, and exit farming. These are the top uh, most useful practices identified by producers, and you can see many different um, states and um, many of these surveys surveyed 500,000, 1,500 farmers. Um, so producers recognize, farmers recognize the benefits of this kind of diversification. But when you look at the, uh, the adoption rate of these practices uh, around the country, what you see is that only about 37% of acres are actually using, are in reduced tillage, and uh, only 5% of acres are cover cropped in the U.S. And then the, the numbers for New York are 49% acres are in some kind of reduced tillage and about 7% of acres are cover cropped. So why is there, there this discrepancy between what farmers are telling us work the best for them in terms of managing risk for more variable weather? And the amount and the number of farmers or the number of acres that have adopted these practices, which they know work well. And there's been research to look at that too. And so, thinking, looking just at the um, national picture first, um, several many barriers to adoption, or there's some common barriers to adoption that are found. Um, and some of the things that are the most important barriers that are stopping U.S. farmers from adopting these practices include a lack of experience with the practices, inadequate technical assistance, so, that, so they don't have the experience, they don't know how to do this or use these practices, and they also can't get technical assistance to uh, learn more about these practices. There's also what's, uh, there's a low, slow return on investment. So it turns out, turns out that Many of these practices provide the kind of benefits that I've already described, but it takes a little while for those benefits to begin to be enjoyed by the farm. Um, and it costs, it sometimes costs a lot to make that change. You, there's a high upfront investment and a slow return. Um, another thing is many farmers are ineligible for the kind of financing available uh, Either, either subsidized financing or even private financing, these, these kinds of farm management changes are often ineligible. And then there are a few market incentives for uh, farmers basically can't uh, pay for the cost of making this change by raising prices in the market. And the, in 2019, the estimated shortfall or gap between desire of farmers to change, make these changes, and the assistance, technical and financial assistance to make these changes um, was about 1.5 billion was the gap in 2019. And that's uh, estimating that available funds meets from between 20 to 50% of demand. So there's a clear need based on this, this research, there's a clear need for just more funding, more funding both for technical assistance and also financial assistance. I also was involved in some research that was funded by Scenic Hudson back in 2019. We asked many of these same questions to farmers in the Hudson Valley. So this is much more regional and uh, a regional look at the same question of what are the barriers to adopting these practices that farmers know increase the resilience, uh, the climate resilience of their farms, and researchers know and create benefits downstream to the communities uh, nearby these farms. And so what we found in this, this research, uh, talking with farmers and agricultural stakeholders in the Hudson Valley, is that the barriers here are complex and inflexible programs. So they have difficulty getting into the program, understanding the programs, and also meeting program requirements. Um, there's limited technical and financial resources, the same thing that we saw at the national level. 
And then another thing that came out in this study that's a little bit different is that the, the current programs disadvantage producers who are already using some of these climate resilience practices. So they tend to support better, they provide more support for producers who aren't using any of them. We also asked farmers and, and other uh, service providers, what, how do we change this? What are the, the most, what are the best changes that we could make to the existing technical uh, assistance programs to um, reduce or remove those barriers? And so just very quickly, um, some of the most favored, the most favored assistance strategies, we have these different categories. So in technical assistance, they'd like to see more flexible assistant programs, assistance programs and more whole farm planning. So we're actually not looking at one specific part of the farm, but looking at the farm as a whole and then thinking about what practices will improve the resilience of the whole farm. In terms of production practices, they'd like to see more support for diversification. We saw that uh, in the, the, that's what farmers told us, all the farmers told us in national research studies about what are some of the best practices to enhance resilience. So diversification, uh, we also saw that here in the Hudson Valley. So more support for diversification, more support for improved water management, and also more support for energy efficiency. In terms of financial assistance, they, the farmers asked for 100% cost share and instead of what's typical now, what's common now, which is about 75% of the cost is subsidized and then the farmer bears the cost of about 25%. So looking at um, some kind of 100% cost share and the other piece of that is also getting the uh, funds to do the change up front rather than after they're done. Um, very important part of that 100% cost share idea too. Also, farmers said they would be able to use low cost equipment, loans and grants, as well as tax incentives. And then an interesting part of this study was farmers are also thinking about how they can change marketing, which is not something we're talking about today so much, but um, just wanted to include it. And they're really interested in, in, they could use some help developing regional markets and also um, a ways to add value to the products they're growing by doing some kind of on-farm processing. So just to sum up, um, I think one way we can think about the changes on farms that are gonna promote uh, healthier and more resilient landscapes, and that will support resilient community, is to think about the many number of, any number of practices that we can do together um, and add to different kinds of landscapes within our communities. Um, today, what I've talked about is uh, integrated, we've talked a little bit about water management, livestock management, cropland management, agroforestry. Ecosystem restoration can also play a part in this and farms are, are excellent uh, locations for doing ecosystem restoration as well. And then finally, agricultural, agricultural diversification. And I just want, I, I want to sh also, I, I show this slide because what I like about it is it's showing the whole system from the, the broadest reaches of a community in the forest through farmland and into urban lands. And it makes the point that we really, we have all this landscape that we can think about and manage for resilience. And the other thing to notice, if you look towards the bottom of the screen, you can see that I, I mentioned a, a little while ago, multiple benefits, and I just wanna go through them at this point. And all the practices that I talked about today um, provide all of these multiple benefits. So climate mitigation, sequestering carbon, climate adaptation, building resilience, not only on farms, but also in community. Um, what, reducing or restoring land that's been degraded increasing biodiversity, and also enhancing food security, which is something that I haven't discussed today. The last thing I want to say is just to remind you that one of the one thing that is so powerful about agricultural solutions is that it includes food, it includes the food system. And it turns out that some of the most powerful ways to um, enhance mitigation, so slow down and reverse climate change, has to do with how we eat. So reduced food loss and waste 
is one of those really powerful solutions and also shifting to a more plant-rich diet is another one. So uh, if, if you remember nothing else from this pr presentation, I want you to remember that it's going to get more difficult and expensive to grow food, that the climate stress will strain relationships between farmers and communities, but that agricultural landscapes can be a source of solutions. And one thing I thought was interesting as I was thinking through this presentation was uh, that agriculture as a solution actually has a role in each theme of the Bond Act, land conservation, water quality and infrastructure, particularly green infrastructure, restoration and reducing flood risk and mitigation because of the biological sequestration on farms. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to hearing the other panelists. Thank you, Laura. That was very, very interesting. And just I've been a participant with Glenwood Farms where Laura works for the last uh, 12 years, I think. So it's a marvelous place if you don't know it. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce Maureen, Maureen Coleman, whom I introduced before, but if she has anything that she wishes us to know that I didn't say, she will tell us. So um, I'm just passing this, uh, this over to you. Um, and you're now the host and... Great. And Great. I, don't have, I don't think I have anything to add, and so I'll just... Uh, pull up my uh, presentation and we'll get we'll get going. Okay. Or not. <laughs> you are screen sharing, but there's nothing on your there we go. Is it coming up? Yeah, we have today's conference, right? Oh. And the EFC overview. We do have the EFC overview. Is the oh, next? you do? Okay, so I'm not seeing it. Okay. All right, I'm just going to close to get some other stuff. I usually, as I explained before this, have someone else doing this for me, so I'm not very good. Okay, so you do, it is up on your screen. Everyone yeah, you want to make it. the slide that's on your screen um, full sized if you can. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'm showing that it's full, but okay. Okay, because we're, can you you're, double? You're not seeing it? We're seeing it. We're just seeing right, the next slide as well. Much for practicing. I but I think it's okay, Maureen. Okay, because you're, you're seeing the two at a time? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. All right, I don't want to hold people up, but um, can I do this? Did I just totally mess it up? I can't no. see. No, it has nothing's changed. Okay. All right. So I'll just go along and <laughs> hopefully. Um, okay. So just quickly, EFC overview. Hopefully, um, all the participants are aware of EFC. But if not, we're a public benefit corporation, basically a state public authority. Um, our mission is to provide low cost capital, um, zero interest loans to end grants for local wastewater and drinking water infrastructure projects. Um, we provide financial assistance through, basically through the clean water and drinking water state revolving fund programs, and more recently through several state programs. Since um, we, EFC is a national leader in water infrastructure investment since 1990, ESC has provided $32 billion in clean water and greater than $8 billion in drinking water, subsidized and zero interest loans, grants, and loan refinancings to municipality. And since 2015, we've provided nearly $2 billion in state grants. So first, the state revolving funds which again, until 2015, when we started providing um, significant state grants, this really was the, the big programs through which we provided financial assistance to municipalities. 
EPA provides capitalization grants annually to all 50 states and Puerto Rico to fund their SRF programs. Generally, there's a 20% state match. Um, each state has to operate their own revolving funds. They, um, again, provide low cost and zero interest financing and grants for water infrastructure projects. And as recipients pay back both principal and interest, those repayments revolve back into the fund so that we can make new loans to additional recipients. And over time, the funds actually grow. And a, an objective of the, of the SRS is to, um, in perpetuity, have a sustainable method of infrastructure finance so that we can continue to the SRFs if at some point EPA discontinues those annual capitalization grants. So the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Excuse me one sec. Um, Maureen, you're not forwarding your slides. So, okay, I am on my screen, but it's not, you're not seeing the no. slides? I mean, your presentation is extremely interesting without slides, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Uh, all right. See, I, um, I'm so sorry, everybody. I practice this. I don't know why it's not moving. I am going to um, share this the uh, PowerPoint with folks. So hopefully now if I click on this, okay, if I click on each screen, are you seeing a different one now? No. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Okay, I'm having technical, I'm getting technical assistance here. I really, I really apologize. <laughs> Please, it's it's a brave new world for all of us. Yeah. So here, I'm sure it's going in, but it's not. It's not moving. It's not going to. That looks better. Okay, now, okay. So now we can share. Thank you, whomever you are, Magic Woman. Yes, oh my gosh, she's normally handles these things for me, so. Okay. So now, are you seeing the full, the full screen? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna back up and talk about first the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. That program uh, began in 1987 under the Clean Water Act. And each state had to enact their own Clean Water State Revolving Fund program. So New York State did that and provides the low cost, zero interest financing and grants for wastewater and water quality infrastructure. The Clean Water SRF Fund in New York is administered by EFC and DEC. And for the Clean Water SRF, it's basically EFC that does everything um, for the program pursuant to an MOU with DEC. And the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, that began, that program began in 1996 under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that provides the low cost, zero interest financing and grants for public drinking water infrastructure. And that's administered by EFC and the Department of Health. And different than the Clean Water SRF, DOH does all the technical reviews um, of the projects. And basically EFC, pursuant to an MOU, provides the financial, administrative, um, and legal support for that program. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I, I mentioned um, growing the funds for uh, a sustainable source of financing. And as of March 31st of this year, the total net position of New York's CWSRF was 5.9 billion. And for the drinking water state revolving fund, it was 1.4 billion. 
So we take that job seriously of maintaining the uh, integrity of the funds and making sure that those funds um, grow. So a big topic of late for most folks is the bipartisan infrastructure law. And it was enacted in November on November 15th, 2021 as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or IIJA. And, uh, but it's been known uh, now as bipartisan infrastructure law. And it provides 43.4 billion over five years for the SRS nationally. The water infrastructure investments are being um, funneled, <laughs> being uh, distributed to municipalities through the SRFs. So in federal fiscal year 2022, um, and we just did an amendment to our 2022 intended use plan, um, as did um, for the clean water and for the drinking water. New York is getting $426.8 million. And we're estimating in federal fiscal year 2023 that we'll get um, even more at $482.3 million. Um, this is an addition to the annual SRF appropriations of which for the clean water SRF, we get 120 to say $175 million um, and then the state match. Um, and then drinking water gets a significantly lower amount, probably 30 to $45 million from EPA annually. We provide the additional subsidy, uh, which is the grants that we provide those dollars go to disadvantaged or hardship communities or um, those projects that benefit environmental justice areas. So here is the breakdown of all of the dollars that New York State is getting both in 2022 and estimated 2023. And then the far right column is how much of the capitalization grant we need to give out an additional subsidy. And in New York State, we're giving that out in grants. So on the four, first line, we're getting $196,443,000 in general supplemental, which is basically the same, um, we can use that for the same types of funds we would normally use our clean water SRF program for 49% exactly of 196,443,000 must be given out as additional subsidy. So we then decide how that is distributed. We have chosen at EFC for Clean Water SRF that we'll be giving out 50% grants from the bill dollars, and then we will make up the difference from our annual um, capitalization grant that we get. Clean Water Emerging Contaminants, we received $10 million, uh, a little over $10 million. All of that is given out in grants. So those will give, be given out in um, full grants to participants and it's very, there were a lot of back and forth with EPA and it's a little difficult to find projects because of the definitions and some restrictions, how we can use those dollars. But we actually have found um, 10 or so projects through DEC um, helped us out and they were going to use those dollars to do some investigation of PFAS contamination at um, contaminated sites. So we're happy that we could put that to good use. And then drinking water um, received considerable um, 73 and a half million for their general supplemental. Lead service lines, which is a big thing, replacing lead service lines in municipalities, 115 million. Um, and then emerging contaminants, and they got the 30, uh, 30 almost 31 million for that, and 100% uh, will be given out in that. And that will be very helpful um, to be added to the pots of money we've been giving out through the state, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later under our uh, grant program, water grant programs. Maureen, excuse me, since you're the host, would you just go to the participants at the bottom? of your screen, click on it. And if anybody is in the waiting room, just press admit all. Okay, well, I was set up with that and now I don't have. If you don't have it then. Yeah, it's not showing. Are more right, people trying to get in? Uh, apparently so. So let me, um, will you make me host for one sec? 
Click on my little picture. Yep. <laughs> okay, got it. Thanks. Oh, I'm not host yet. Nope, nope. Here it comes. Sorry, everybody. The vagaries of technology. Nope, still not. Uh, I made you. Um, did you click? Yep, I clicked on make you host. Yeah, but then there's one more screen that comes up after that. You have to click on yes, make me host. You're oh, here yes. it is. Gosh, I do okay. apologize. All right, I'm going to just admit this one person. And now we're good to go. I'm making you host again. Okay, so oh. we can, oh, so the Hold honorable on. assemblyman can have a chance. I'm going to speed up. <laughs> um, okay, so th that's our, our federal programs. And then we have a number of state programs. Uh, three that I'm going to talk about under the consolidated funding application, the engineering plant uh, planning grant program that is uh, specifically an EFC program. And it builds um, a pipeline of clean water SRF projects, which um, has been very successful. You can get up to 100,000 for inflow infil infiltration studies and uh, uh, reports um, for uh, engineering reports required by, uh, if the studies are required by enforcement action and up to 50,000 for other projects. And since inception of the program in 2012, we've dispersed 14.9 million for 503 projects, which has resulted in greater than a eight, 135 million in uh, clean water SRF financings. So, um, and hopefully we'll get a lot more. The Green in Innovation Grant Program, GIGP, uh, a couple of years ago, when we first started this program, we did have water efficiency and energy efficiency. And then we got just, we did just green stormwater infrastructure. We've now added back in water efficiency and energy efficiency um, to the green stormwater infrastructure with, uh, more money, uh, maximum grants uh, available for the green stormwater infrastructure. And the higher amounts that you see listed here, those uh, maximum amounts go for hardship communities or projects benefiting EJ areas. And then a DEC program, water quality improvement program, um, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. And it's um, really for more specific projects that, the types of projects that are funded annually um, can change based on DEC priorities, where um, our state grants that I'm gonna talk about um, next uh, are really for more broader, any kinds of any kind of projects. Maureen, so, we're not seeing your slides again. So it's not a big deal because you're describing everything perfectly. That's so weird. Why would they? Oh, it's because when you were, when you gave me the hosting duties for a minute, then you have to share your screen again. Not to worry. Don't okay. worry. It's all good. You'll get, you'll get it all. I will send it out. Okay. Thanks. So then, you know, sure everybody's familiar in 2017 we had the 2.5 billion dollar clean water infrastructure act uh, of 2017 or quia and that was a an historic state investment for clean water infrastructure in 2017 we had at least a billion dollars for water infrastructure improvement or wea grants 150 million for intermunicipal water infrastructure grants or img um Seven, 75 million for septic system replacement fund, 10 million for emergency financial assistance loans and 100 million for green infrastructure. Some of those dollars, which we've used for our GIGP program, which I just spoke about. And we just, uh, if it hasn't been announced yet, um, I, we're going to announce this today. So hopefully I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. Um, participants uh, the, the, for the next round, 27 municipalities, which will be, um, participating in the asset management program, which uh, provides them the resources and the technical assistance uh, to really do a robust survey of their clean water infrastructure and make sure that they plan for proper maintenance and uh, updates to their systems. So we have grants, which has been around, they actually started in 2015 with 400 million and then was continued under QUIA of 2017. Um, we provide them for clean water and drinking water. 
We just went out um, in the spring for 225 million available. And the, um, I think it was July 9th where the, the application period closed. So we're reviewing those applications um, right now. For clean water, you could get 25% of net eligible project cost up to 25 million drinking water. It's 60% up to 5 million unless you're an emerging contaminants project above the MCL levels for emerging contaminants. And then you get 60% with no uh, max, no maximum grant. IMG grants are for the same type of projects, but they have to be joint projects. So if you're consolidating um, treatment systems or you're um, doing a real joint project where you're building a new system. Um, Maureen, that's for that. Would we be able to wrap up soon? Cause it's not- yep, I'm just finishing up. Perfect. This, no, a septic system replacement fund provides $10,000 um, or 50% of homeowners in pri priority geographic areas, which are determined by DEC, EFC. And then I do want to just sneak in a small program, but important, which is our clean vessel assistance program, which provides grants for pump out and um, stations that receive sewage from recreational marine um, vessels. And that will be in the um, PowerPoint when you get it and $4.2 billion uh, environmental bond act, which will provide 650 million for wastewater infrastructure, municipal stormwater and other water quality projects, as well as the 1.1 billion for flood risk re uh, reduction. So um, we've invested at record levels, but there's still uh, tens of billions of dollars of need in New York. So um, EFC is happy to get whatever dollars we can get. Now, I will share. Thank you so much, Maureen. Yeah, sorry so, about all the technical difficulties. I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties, <laughs> but we're all going to share. You. Just make me co-host. Oh, you? Make me host. OK. Yeah? OK. Thank you. Um, so now, the honorable and estim estimable Steve Otis. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Maureen. You know, I have to say, well, there may have been technical difficulties with the PowerPoint, um, the Environmental Facilities Corporation and Maureen Coleman do such a great job in getting money as quickly as possible to local governments when it comes to these water grants. And so I tell people in state government, if it were up to me, EFC would administer all state grants, whatever the topic, whatever the subject area is, that's how good the team there is and, and they, how they work with the local governments and uh, municipal staff on working out the details and getting things going. Uh, Maureen went through uh, uh, all the great things that EFC does in terms of resources. And I wanna give a little perspective as it relates to uh, the Bond Act um, but also it relates to the history of, of these water grant programs that we started in 2015, because there's a, a message there in terms of how important the Bond Act is more broadly for boosting our environmental programs throughout the state. Um, back in 2008, uh, the Department of Health and the Department of Environmental Conservation did a survey of what the water infrastructure needs were around the state. And it was determined that uh, there was a uh, $36.2 billion need in wastewater and a $38.7 billion need in drinking water infrastructure that uh, the state was gonna have to address over time. That was 13 years ago. And uh, we have spent a lot of money since then, but not enough. I also throw in that Environmental Advocates has done a very good job of tracking the WEA program, which we Water Infrastructure Improvement Act, which we started in 2015. And what we find is that even with a lot of money out the door, the need continues to be uh, far in excess of the funds that are there. So the point of the Bond Act, the point of the federal money that Maureen was talking about is that we need to continue to supplement the assistance to local governments to do clean water projects. When WEA was created in 2015, the, uh, the first year, we only spent 75 million. And uh, year two, it went up to uh, 175, then 
uh, year three, 255 million, 269, went to in 2019 to 416 million, 2021, 638 million, bringing in some other funding, bringing in some federal funding. Um, uh, Maureen talked about in 2017, the state began an annual commitment of a half a billion dollars a year for a variety of clean water programs. Um, most of that money goes to these EFC programs. Some of them go to some DEC programs. The state has made a big commitment uh, without the Bond Act, is gonna get a big boost with the Bond Act and with the federal funds. To date, uh, we have, uh, through WIA and IMG, um, funded uh, $1.8 billion in grants to local governments over um, 880 projects, and uh, it's created over 100,000 jobs. Now think of what the Bond Act will do in the multiplier effect of good environmental projects, not just on clean water, but in other areas. Uh, and, and, and that's the point. The point is there's a, a great unmet need on clean water. Um, there's an unmet need in terms of uh, the better uh, better practices in terms of uh, more, more uh, dealing with water runoff from the agricultural farmland, as we heard from Laura at the beginning, a great presentation. Uh, so I, I guess my message is that it's even more than the $4.2 billion that's in the Environmental Bond Act. What you're going to see is you're going to see um, institutionalizing new programs, new funding streams that are going to really allow uh, municipalities, counties around the state, the state government to do a better job on, on climate change, on resilience, on water quality. I'm going to make one last pitch for something else that's in the Bond Act, which is there is a proposal um, that I initiated for a new program on stormwater grants. I'm hoping EFC is going to administer it, but in the Bond Act, there'd be a new program to fund uh, stormwater grants to municipalities because what we found out more, most recently in Ida is the stormwater infrastructure, like the wastewater and the drinking water infrastructure, needs a lot of help, and the Bond Act will provide important, important state funding to help accomplish those goals. So it is 2.59. I think I have filled the assignment of uh, not going over to the next, uh, next panel and uh, uh, Maureen, great to be on with you. You know, at the beginning, Laura said she wrote a book. I think that Maureen and I actually could write a book together because we work together very closely on this stuff. So um, thank you, Julie. And uh, thank, thank you, you all that, that attended this panel. I'm so sorry we don't have time for questions, but um, you can reach all of the participants and their bios are in our bios field. Um, on our NISAC website. Thanks, everybody. So close out Zoom and go back to uh, Gathertown and you can get to your next panel.